This episode brought to you by Mint Mobile, the first company to sell wireless services online only. Check us out at Grand Rapids Comic Con November 11th to the 13th. Hope to see you there. Ah, uh, Mr. 26, come right in. <laughs> party, party, party. Mr. Anakin Skywalker, welcome back, sir. That name no longer has any meaning for me. Oh, um, Annie? That's better, 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 better. Stupid AI voice. This deal is getting worse all the time. <laughs> Name? Anastasia. Sorry, you're not on the list. What? Oh, check it again, darling. Anastasia with four A's? Sorry, ma'am. This club is exclusively for Disney characters only. Exactly. I am a Disney princess. Not according to the list, you're not. <laughs> it's okay. Listen, buddy. Do you know how much money I put down to get into this club? I paid millions to convince people I'm an authentic Disney princess. Well, it ain't fooling me. Possible. I sing, I dance, I insult the original source material, I even got former Disney animators to work on me. Sorry, Thumbelina. Anastasia! But if you're not on the list, you're not on the list. <laughs> you silly. Don't embarrass me in front of my fans. They all think I belong here. I'm giving you two seconds to roam the hell off. Have a heart! Yes, yes. Have you tried throwing money at it? That always works. Okay, bye, -bye. Mr. Chappie, great to see you again, sir. Oh, Bob, Bob, you're the CEO. You have to let me into Disney. Oh, I remember you, Princess Daphne! Anastasia! You used to work for Fox, right? Well, we bought Fox, so technically, you are a part of Disney! Oh, good! Does that mean I get to go into your club? Since I am a part of Disney... I'm the Nostalgia Critic guy, remember it, so you don't have to. Well, Fox, you tried so hard to be Disney, you can't like you didn't get your wish. <music> 1997's Anastasia was yet another attempt by a major studio to cash in on the Disney animated formula. And to their credit, it wasn't a cheap attempt. They got legendary animators Don Bluth and Gary Goldman to helm it, who gave Disney a run for their money in the past, celebrity voices, top songwriters, some of Disney's past musical talents, and one hell of an advertising budget. I remember being 15 and being like, yeah, I don't like kids' cartoons anymore, but I got pretty hyped seeing their first look with pencil sketches and music on the big screen. Similar to, you guessed it, like Disney used to. The biggest con in history! I also kind of liked it because it looked like they blew up the dog in the movie. Again, why I'm a cat person. So To this day, I still hear a ton of people call this a Disney movie. The film did well, the biggest profit Bluth made for a movie, but not quite the Disney numbers they were looking for. Part of the reason being Disney 2 was concerned folks would confuse this for their work, so they re-released The Little Mermaid on the big screen, coincidentally the same month for a limited amount of time. Coming to theaters Friday, November 14th for 17 days only. That company's a monster. So I'll admit, when I first saw this, I didn't like it. I didn't hate it, but the advertising worked so well, I really was expecting something on the same level as the great Disney masterpieces, or hell, the great Bluth masterpieces. Looking back, it is better than I remember, possibly because I am missing hand-drawn animation with every passing year. I think this is a very good film for kids, but kind of a messy one for grown-ups. That's not to say adults can't enjoy a ton of it, but there are a lot of tiny missteps that add up to a shaky staircase. It's not death by a thousand cuts, it's more, eh, by a hundred cuts. 
Either way, it'll be cool to see these masters of animation again bring to life one of their most expensive and lavish looking productions ever. This is Fox's, not Disney's, at the time, Anastasia. The film opens in CinemaScope, the first one since In Like Flint to be shot that way. Yes, that is where the comparison stop. Where we get a narration from Blue's favorite actress to work with, the late Angela Lansbury. How do I know? I asked him years ago. Who are your favorite actors that you've ever worked with? Without a blush, I can tell you. That would be Angela Lansbury. This is a woman that, you know, her persona on screen and on stage, you would never suspect. She's a very, very humble lady and, and eager to please and to help whatever she can. And this is the part that was the clincher for me. She didn't go out <clears throat> and buy fancy lunches. Every day she brought her own little brown bag lunch, and I thought, oh, that is so appealing. Aww. There was a time when we lived in an enchanted world of elegant palaces. Fresh off the backs of Russian peasantry. On the wind, cross the sea. Lansbury plays Dowager Empress Marie, who's in the middle of a big celebration with her family, including her granddaughter, Anastasia, played here by Kirsten Dunst. Yeah, she was to the 90s what DeVay Chase was to the 2000s. If you just needed girl, she was the go-to. It plays our lullaby. Read what it says. It says you're doomed to be shot. On that note, their confidant, Rasputin, played by Christopher Lloyd, is upset he wasn't invited to the baby shower, I mean celebration, so he curses them to die via spinning wheel, I mean vague off-screen stuff. Mark my words, you and your family will die within the fortnight. And 20th Century Fox will exploit this historical bloodbath as a cuddly fairy tale. Yeah, okay, I guess I should talk about that. A lot of people at the time hated the historical inaccuracies of this, but if you're dumb enough to fall for it, you weren't gonna look up the truth anyway. Did anyone really believe this movie with a talking bat or Pocahontas with a talking tree really happened? It's historical fiction, or I guess a historical fairy tale. And even on that note, there are surprisingly a lot of historical Easter eggs. This drawing where Anastasia says, Olga made me so mad. She said it looked like a pig riding a donkey. <laughs> she really did draw that, and that really is what was said about it. There really was a music box. Anastasia did love practical jokes. Vlad is loosely based on Count Vladimir Frederick's The Court Minister. Even Dimitri has a slight connection to a European prince who swore he found the grown-up Anastasia based on his one time meeting her in childhood. Give the movie credit, that's the most research I've ever done on the Romanov, so it's doing something right. It looks like a revolution starts and the royal family is under attack. Anastasia! Hi. Oh, um, there's Bartok the Bad. Kind of random introduction. Okay, later. <laughs> Rasputin attacks but gets caught in the icy river. Wow, the anime Rasputin was surprisingly easier to kill than the real Rasputin. I was frozen! <laughs> and Anastasia is accidentally knocked out and left behind. And nothing bad ever happened in Russian politics again. Ten years pass in Notre Dame, I mean, what's Hunchback? You're Hunchback. As St. Petersburg is buzzing about a rumor that while the Romanovs are dead, Anastasia may still be alive. <laughs> it probably goes without saying the songs by Stephen Flaherty and Lynn Arins are pretty damn good. They're big, hummable, sound nice, and are extremely easy to remember. I have a useless observation, but hey, when has that stopped me before? I always found it humorous that an animated song around Rasputin and the Romanoffs sounds eerily similar to an Animaniac song around Rasputin and the Romanoffs. Though since the revolution, our lives have been so great. I really like Rasputin, cause I don't realize I could be smart and gossip and get us through the day. I only like Rasputin, cause I am hypnotized. Hey! That makes this song immediately bad and nobody can enjoy it. But I like the way- I said nobody, Susie! It's the rumor, the legend, the mystery. I am clearly not John Cusack who is singing now. Yep, that's John Cusack as Dimitri, or will be when he's not in a song. I have to remember. And I bought it for someone in the fall of 1983, pile. The biggest con in history! That ain't you! And to be fair, all the singing is dubbed apart from Lansbury Peters and Kelsey Grammer, who plays Dimitri's friend, Vladimir. 
<laughs> no, not that one. This guy wants to lie and cheat his way into riches. Well, that joke wrote itself. Well, Dimitri, I got to the theater. But these two are likable con artists, as they plan to say they found Anastasia all these years later and plan to get reward money for her. Little do they know the real Anastasia, played by Meg Ryan, has grown up in an orphanage, of course, with a bout of amnesia, and is going out into the world now that she's grown up. You go straight down this path till you get to the fork in the road. What did you call me? Send me a sign! Hi, doggy. Hey! Ryan's okay, though her performance does feel like one long 90s rom-com quip. Me? Go to Paris? Well, actually... What are you circling me? What, are, what, were you a vulture in another life? Grateful to get away! Who's to say I'm not a princess or a duchess or whatever she is? Ha! Don't give me a good-looking man to hate or I might love him! Actually, the film seems to flip-flop between 90s rom-com, fairy tale Disney, and old-school Bluth. A lot of people said this was trying to mix too many different styles, but I respectfully disagree. I think these styles can go together in an animated family film, and part of the time, they do. In all honesty, I can point out all the issues of this film in one and a half problems. The main problem I'll get to in a minute, but the half problem? I don't think the staging is particularly cinematic. The animation is still wonderful, and the background's often amazing, but the angles are usually pretty stale. See, here's the thing. Bluth does animate people, but they're not usually the focus. He likes his leads to be mice, dogs, baby dinosaurs, cats. All characters that welcome a variety of unique and interesting angles. You have to try to make what they see not interesting. Here, though, everything is mostly shot straightforward, like it's a stage play. I guess that makes sense, because this would become a stage play and Bluth himself directed a few stage shows. But because of that, there's not really a variety of angles. It's almost always a medium shot or a medium wide shot. Even the bigger shots look like something you would see in a Broadway musical rather than a cinematic epic. But I say that's a half problem because there are some shots that are very cinematic. Anastasia makes her way to the abandoned palace singing about how she feels like she's been there before. My memory. Now that's cinematic! When you hear this hauntingly beautiful music, this is the kind of stuff you want to see. Imagery literally leaping out at you. The camera spins, swoops in, has all sorts of cool effects. Stuff only movies and animation can accomplish. It's a pretty cool number. Hey! <gasps> Dimitri and Vladimir find her though and figure out quickly she looks very similar to the Grand Duchess. Now, you said something about travel papers. You said something about being on an offenders list? She says she has an amulet that indicates her family is in Paris, and they convince her she might actually be the lost Romanov. Even though deep down, they think she probably isn't. Anastasia's dead. All the Romanovs are dead. Meanwhile, Bartok, played by Hank Azarian, looking like the fern gully bat microwaved into Pinky in the Brain, is shocked to find an ancient relic of Rasputin's comes back to life and takes him to the underworld. Who dance in truth? Wow, for all that build up traveling in between worlds, Rasputin's entrance is kind of underwhelming. A lot of characters are like that. Bartok, the return of Rasputin, even that dog I'm not sure we ever got the name for. Puka. Okay, shut up. But you get my point, they're all just kind of there. You think he's gonna get reintroduction like the Horn King, like really build him up, but oh, jump cut, there he is. I'll also say, with the exception of him literally falling apart, Rasputin's not that interesting a Bluth villain. He gets a really cool song, arguably the best one in the movie. No, seriously, this is kind of a jam. But this imagery is nowhere near as threatening as previous Bluth films. While many of the backgrounds in the human world are lush and detailed, the backgrounds in the underworld are a little basic and kind of empty and sometimes repeat themselves. Could be a time or budget thing, but it does lead to the film's biggest problem, inconsistency. And what, in my opinion, is the cause of that? I know it's gonna sound weird, but I think it's the editing. Now, editing in an animated film is vastly different from live action. Jeffrey Katzenberg figured that out when he wanted Black Cauldron to be re-edited and didn't allow the proper time or budget for it. In live action, if you want to extend a scene, you cut to a different shot or let the scene play longer. In animation, you have to create the shot from scratch. Literally every frame has to be planned out before you film it. 
Many scenes in this movie I think were either cut down or weren't given the proper screen time to leave an impact. Here's an example. Watch the end of this villain song. She'll be mine! It wanted to start the next scene way too fast. Imagine if another great villain song got that treatment like Hellfire. right, does it? A scene like this would work better if they just left a little time to take in what you saw. Be Prepared did that, remember? It had this big build up, then just a little bit of black and a little bit of silence. I think you can do that here. Let's try it. I'm gonna add just a little bit of extra time at the end. It didn't take much, but it added a lot. Yet a lot of songs end the same way Dark of the Night did. One ticket to Paris, please. Honestly, a lot of moments work that way. We have a nice long shot of Rasputin saying his evil plan, and then these weird choppy edits. No, Your Grace. We're taking a bus. A bus. In fact, I'm pretty sure those are from other scenes. Again, animation's a bitch to edit, I understand, but movies are made in the edit, and there are noticeable problems in the transitions here. Like, if I just randomly cut to commercial right now, that would be dis- Here in the farmlands of America, we farm all sorts of things that people need, like Mint Mobile. We grow lots of mint mobile here, and it tastes delicious. Not like mint, surprisingly, more like America. No, do not actually eat mint mobile. Because after years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So I first heard that mint mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month. I thought, what's a catch? But after talking to them and using their surface, it all made sense. There isn't one. Unless, of course, the catch is it tastes like America. No, do not eat America. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless services service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. I love their high quality service in comparison to my previous provider. I like that they cut out the middleman and I save a lot of money with them. We also grow money here. They say it doesn't grow on trees, well it does on our farm. If money is apples, which it's not. I'm an apple. Just thought you should know who you're getting this information from, an apple. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family of apples. No, don't buy for a family of apples, it's a joke. Or maybe do, I don't know, I don't think it's illegal. Probably best not to. But at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest. 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. I was just lying before when I said it was an apple. I'm actually a kitchen. And as a kitchen that acquired consciousness, I'm gonna give you a special deal. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash nostalgia. That's mintmobile.com slash nostalgia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash nostalgia. You can also win me as a new kitchen if you can guess what accent this is supposed to be. No, you can't actually win me as a kitchen and this isn't an accent. I don't know what it is, but it isn't an accent. No, don't eat kitchens. And take advantage of this deal. Bye. Distracting. Our heroes catch a train, and again, to give you an idea of the tone change, the odd edits add, look at this very typical rom-com argument and what it naturally cuts to. I was only asking a simple no. question. Traction. Ridiculous. Forgot we were in ecto-gremlins, right? The monsters attack the car with our heroes on it, and they try to make their way to safety. And you think that could have been you? 
Okay, this isn't quite Lost World ordering Big Macs while calling for help, but there are too many singers in this. So if the whole movie had choppy editing, it wouldn't be good, not even for kids. But moments like this are what help balance it out a bit. Vladimir convinces Anya that she is someone special, and though it's a short moment, it plays out exactly as long as it needs to. It allows the animation, acting, music, and even unique camera angle to really shine. I see and fire a young woman who has shown a regal command equal to any royal in the world. To bed is followed by Dimitri's Weinstein hands. Not until you get this right. I do not remember him coming off this creepy. Baron Pushkin. He was short. I hear he's gotten very fat. And I recall his yellow cat. I don't believe we told her that. Okay, so this is definitely a nitpick, but it feels weird not bringing it up. Should they have cut the opening? I guess not totally scrap it, but maybe sum it up in simple imagery like Beauty and the Beast, but instead of a stained glass window, it's a babushka, I don't know. But by seeing this is clearly the Grand Duchess, do we lose something? That cat line might have had more weight if we didn't know it was her. When she sings Once Upon a December, would it be more interesting if we didn't know it was a memory and maybe just illusions of grandeur? Would it be more chilling if we found out that song later was actually from the music box? Would Rasputin be more creepy if we didn't see him interact with the royal family and was just left to our imagination how it all went down? Here's the thing, it is meant for kids too, so you want to make sure they follow the story as well as you can, but I can't help but wonder if we'd be more invested if we legit didn't know if she was the real deal or not. It'd be much more of a mystery if we thought maybe she was Grand Duchess Ariel. Yeah, you know that was a Fox note. And suddenly, I see it at a glance. As you'd imagine, Dimitri and her start to fall in love, and it's pretty cool that not only does Kelsey Grammer get a song to himself, he always has a great voice, but where most Disney musicals at the time had about five songs, this one has seven. Many Disney-style animated films usually do less songs. It's pretty cool that they did more in this one. Oh, and I say there wasn't much old-school scary bluth in this? This scene might change my mind. I'll get inside your mind where you can't escape me. Uh, we're saving the scary eyes for Dimitri, thank you so much. It gets even more dark when he makes her sleepwalk, dreaming that she's returning to her family when really she's about to drown herself. This is actually pretty twisted. Hello, sunshine. Jump in. Come on in, the water's hell. <laughs> Dimitri wakes her up in time and, again, try not to laugh at how abrupt the tone changes. It's all right. This is like Snow White singing about her prince, interrupted by the scary trees out of nowhere. <laughs> Rasputin rockets his way to the surface because I don't know, and they make their way to Paris, where they talk to Marie's lady-in-waiting, Sophie, played by Bernadette Peters. How did you escape a boy? who worked in the palace. Of course, Dimitri puts together that she's the real deal because he was that boy. But they'll have to wait because, like Disney, they know the importance of dolls with different outfits. Be treasurely and so smart. While I do think this is one of the lesser songs in the film, the art style is really cool, going neo-impressionistic. I feel like this is one of the few things you wouldn't see in a Disney princess movie. It honestly kind of looks like a Bakshi flick for a bit. All that's missing is an animal saying something that gets canceled today. They get dressed up for the ballet to meet up with Marie afterwards as Dimitri tells Vlad she's the real deal. You will walk out of her life forever. Well, princesses don't marry kitchen boys. We live in a world where dead people rocket themselves. It's just not reality! While watching the ballet of Cinderella, just assume that'd be easy to make a joke about, but I'm surprisingly having trouble. Anya and Dimitri find they can't quite say the words they want to say. Dimitri. Yes. I just wanted to... Yes? Well? I wanted you to know princesses don't marry kitchen boys. Bye, Felicia. But we need that liar revealed slash third act breakup, so she hears he was holding auditions for Anastasia lookalikes, and now she hates him. And I 
I not only believed you, I actually... Oh! It's not great, but it's one of the few times the fast editing helps because it's not focused on very long. Anya, please, you have to know the truth! Bob, guess I can't get past these two people. That stopped me good. He drives Marie to Anya in a shot that maybe should have been rendered one more time. And we get another great moment that's allowed to play out. Again, it's great animation, great music, and the acting is stellar, as each isn't trying to prove to the other who she is, but rather themselves. You're a very good actress. Best yet, in fact, but I've had enough. There's a great moment where Marie doesn't have to say anything. Just her sitting down shows for the first time in a long time she's letting hope sink in once more. Was our secret my Anastasia's? And mine. It's a really great scene, and again, stops me from saying there's nothing in this for grown-ups because this is a very grown-up moment. Soon you'll be home with me. They sing the music box lullaby and realize they are reunited. I think it's cool too that most movies would be wrapping up around this point, but this is only the beginning of the third act. We see her get used to living with her new family, trying to figure out where her and Dimitri should go from here. And of course, a confrontation with Rasputin. Let the Grand Duchess have her moment! Then we'll kill her. Right, then, then we'll kill her! That was a record scratch, everybody. All that's missing is Rasputin going, Whoa! I wonder if this is what you really want. I found what I was looking for. I found I love stepping on peasants. He didn't take the money. He didn't? No, he stole it. Okay, it was a toss-up between that and this Spaceballs clip. He just took 248 space bucks for lunch, gas, and tolls. You decided I made the right choice. Rasputin approaches Anya and tries to finish her off, but Dimitri, again, just kind of appears. No one can save you! Wanna bet? Oh! Come on, couldn't Rasputin turn to see him, or couldn't Dimitri see she was in trouble? Why is this film allergic to insert shots? It's a pretty cool scene with the statue of a horse coming to life, but again, there's not much of it as the climax is pretty short and Anya steps on the hell ooze or whatever it's supposed to be. Das ist Anya! Are you ready? Again, if there was no interference, Bluth would have a solid minute of him melting. The day is saved! Oh, wait, Dimitri's dead. Oh wait, no he isn't, that was a quick random thing to have there. And the two of them obviously decide to hook up. Ah. Oh. Okay, I'll wear it. They decide to get married, go back to live in Russia, and may want to double think that. And, oh, did we forget to write you in? What? What the? So long, everybody. Ah, 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 looking forward to the spin-off movie where that won't be expanded on. So that was Anastasia. Like I said, it does have a lot of little hiccups that can be distracting for adults, but I don't think they will be for kids. Kids will only focus on the pros, like the great animation, the characters, the songs. Where I think adults will see that too, they just might feel like something's a little off compared to other films like it. It is a movie that feels like a lot of fingerprints were on it and therefore it doesn't have as much of a personal touch. But like I mentioned, Bluth did also do a spin-off film where they let him do whatever he wanted and that's much more of the strange and bizarre stuff we expect from him. It's nothing phenomenal, but it is very charming and has a lot more creative creatures and angles and is allowed to be exactly what it is without feeling rushed. So I guess in some way a fully realized Bluth film did come out of all this. But I don't know, Anastasia still has too many things to be impressed by. It's a fun film to admire, but also pick apart. Its faults weirdly suck me into it more, like trying to figure out where is that line between mainstream conveyor belt and unique one of a kind. I've grown a soft spot for it, even if I can't say it all comes together for adults. I did a review of Jimmy Neutron last week comparing it to a super soaker. Mainly for kids, but adults can admire it for its creativity. Maybe this is like the fancy dollhouse version of that. I can't say it entirely wins me over, but man, it is impossible not to be impressed by it. And in an age where hand-drawn animation just isn't as prevalent as it used to be, I think that goes a very, very, very long way. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember it so you don't have to. So long, everybody. 
Hey everybody! This month for Cameos for Charity, we're doing Wounded Warriors Family Support. Their mission is to provide support to the families of those who have been wounded, injured, or killed during combat operations. The families of these casualties suffer in many ways, some physically, some psychologically. They offer veteran training to assist in meaningful careers, family retreats, and custom outfitted vehicles and grants to enhance the lives of the wounded vets. Rated a four-star nonprofit by Charity Navigator, Wounded Warriors Family Support aids veterans and their families in healing the wounds that medicine cannot. So if you want a cameo from me saying happy birthday, congrats, or whatever, click on the link below and know the money is going to a good cause. Or if you're like, screw your face, I would never get a cameo from you, well, consider checking out this charity anyway. It's a wonderful organization to donate to, spread the word about, or even volunteer at. Take a look at all the amazing good people do out there.